I liked this stuff more though as a kid. And it's funny because Hellcat, I think of as a more grown up type of label, but I was more into this back in the day. What's up, everybody? How you doing? Welcome back to the Punk Rock Review Podcast. Uh, this week, me and Rob are doing something a little different. Uh, we're going to do a label top five. We're doing the top five Hellcat Records releases across the entirety of that label's life, excluding Rancid specifically, because that would be silly. We're both huge Rancid fans, and if we included Rancid albums, I think it would probably just be a top five Rancid albums list, and that would be super dumb so we did allow for side projects of the members of rancid uh but other than that it's it's all non-rancid releases um so what we're going to do is is rob and i have different methods of doing our research this week time limited us a little bit so we're going to let rob tell me his list it's mainly just the records that stand out to him on the label and then i'm going to give you my actual top five and we'll go from there but this should be a fun conversation because hellcat is a very important record label to everybody yeah, and I gotta say, doing the I didn't do research. I just kind of didn't it, complete the research to the very end. Yeah, yeah, time restriction I, uh, and all. I was okay. So like, I wear a Hellcat shirt fairly regularly. It's one of my favorite shirts. One because I like Hellcat, and two, it's like no one else has a Hellcat shirt, and that's something like you know that I get to wear. Around. I'm making my own, but yeah, I don't have like an official one. And it's funny though because like I realized, and I was really into all the stuff. I was like, part I got too bogged down. The research was part of it because I just started listening to full albums and remembering this. Dude. I liked this stuff more though as a kid, and it's funny because Hellcat I think of as a more grown up type of label, but I was more into this back in the day than a lot of it stayed with me. Not that any of it was bad, just a lot of it didn't like stay with me as much as a lot of other more like frivolous. What I consider more frivolous punk rock. Huh. And I, that was so the, interesting the, to me. The more that we talk the more our differences start to poke out because mm -hmm. we have so many things in common. It takes a while to really sift through and find out what little bits of this we disagree on or thing that I like that maybe you don't care so much for. Mm -hmm. Cause I had the opposite experience. I was like, dude, there's too many records on here that I like. It was almost impossible. I, I finally had to start narrowing it down from what do I like to the top five that I personally think are the most relevant uh, that's yeah. ultimately what I what I landed on was like, which ones do I think are the most relevant records that Hellcat's ever put out? Here's my top five. Bam. And it wasn't as much as not not finding quality because I definitely did that. It's just like I just once I kind of stopped listening to like newer stuff in general, like in life. I don't know why Hellcat for some reason got like the short end of that stick. And but looking though at their output too, they also kind of didn't put as much out once you got to about like 2007, 2008. Like the yeah. output on Hellcat Records is also a lot less. So that might be part of it too. It's just the there, label itself was a lot less it's active. Definitely, it's still a label now, but it's definitely smaller. They do the Rancid stuff. They'll do any of their friend stuff, Interrupter stuff. Um, they'll do Tim's little projects and things, the Tim Time Bomb stuff, the, any, any kind of the Hellcat single series. So it's mm -hmm. it's definitely become more of a hobby than a thing I think he was trying to make money with. Because it, it also it also kind of chilled out when he chilled out mm -hmm. so this is definitely his label so i think when he was more in the mix it was more in the mix when he started doing other things it took a back seat to his priorities you know mm -hmm. um and so for that reason i do agree with that a lot i just think that i also because here's the thing we've talked about this before you were much more not a, not not like to a ridiculous degree but like 65 35 Fat Records Epitaph, and I was like 90-10 Epitaph to Fat. So I I was a Hellcat Records dude. Like mm -hmm. that is my favorite record label of all time. And I model a lot of what I do after that label. So but that was the revelation though, because it was a, so as a youth, I was much less into fat. That's always the funny thing. Like I, I liked no effects. I, you know, I liked Lagwagon, no use, that kind of thing. I like no effects a lot. I like no effects, but no effects is kind of an epitaph band to me as well. To me, fat was always just kind of Mike's little label, kind of Mike's Hellcat, so to speak. 
Oh, so I disagree me, with that completely. It, it was it's a, a lot of label, far more relevant label, and it's not. And No Effects was only on, on Epitaph for a short while, so No Effects is a fat record label band. That's like the model of the label. Yeah, but they put Poker, they put so. ten years on Epitaph and had their biggest records come out on Epitaph. So that's why I would I would. Uh, uh, Punk I mean, and Jug Lick, uh, uh, White Trash, uh, Pump of the Value. So long and thanks for all those all came out on Epitaph. S and M Airlines. I mean, the only on one of those that I think would be considered their biggest would be definitely. Punk and Trouble, but the other ones are debatable. I don't, I don't consider them an epitaph label. It's whatever. Mm. Um, no, and, and my point to that was is because I think as a kid, I was mostly epitaph, like period, and that was my that was my point to that. It's like it was like seventy percent epitaph, and then like all of the rest. I don't think I'd never outside of I don't really, I didn't even love Asian Man. I just thought Mike Park was cool, and I like Alkaline Trio and that kind of I like Kung Fu. But as far as labels, where like I had an epitaph shirt back in the day, and I have a Hellcat shirt now. I think those three labels are the only labels I'd ever own a shirt of, of actually, and maybe yours, you know, of, of owning like um, a choice. label. And <laughs> Hell, Hellcat was so much bigger back then for me, just in general, in my music consumption. But there was always two categories. And I wonder if you found this. There's like the Hellcat that was also kind of epitaph. And then there was the Hellcat that was like just straight up Hellcat. Did you, did you ever feel there was, there was a difference between the two? Like the ones that like epitaph no. seemed to more forwardly promote than the ones that were more felt like they were housed in in hellcat no because every word that i've seen promo for any of it i've seen promo for all of it and mm. maybe that's because of where i live i'm in houston so i don't get like uh concentrated you know like promo targeted, stuff. It's either, yeah I, I either get all of it or i get none of it and so yeah. I, I i would say that that's probably part of why but i never felt like that man i honestly Dude, I wasn't even an Epitaph guy, dude. I was a Hellcat guy. I didn't mm. even care about Epitaph like that. Like, when I look back at my record collection past, like, 1998, it was primarily Hellcat stuff up until I was an adult and started, like, branching out to, like, small bands and, like, mm. local stuff. It was part of the scene. So when I was, like, 18, 19, 20 years old, that's when that stuff became more prominent. But, dude, for, like, the first five or six years, dude, it was, like, Hellcat came out at the perfect time for me. I was 16, mm. and it was just, like, that's all I cared about, dude. And you'll you'll hear you're, you're gonna hear some names here. You're gonna be surprised what my list is probably. So let's get this going though, man. We got about an hour. Let's hear. Yeah. Let's hear. Let's hear what you have to say because I want to know what you thought was the most relevant and what stuff you enjoyed the most off the label. Okay, so a few things and a few funny little quirks I found. So like, Left Alone. I like Left Alone. That Hellcat shirt was was bought from a merch tent run by the Left Alone guy. Um, it was, he was just selling general Hellcat stuff that I think Tim just had him going out there in hockey. Very very it, very good band. Left Alone has no actual official first releases on Hellcat. I actually looked that up. That's insane to me. They Wait, are what do you as, mean? yeah. So they have like three records that are released through Hellcat, but they're all re-releases. They have no oh really original first run content as far as full length. Yeah, on Hellcat. So that that blew my mind because they to me they are like Hellcat almost like personified. Um, yeah, I don't even know that I would let that matter. I think I would still, but I mean, well, mm. spoiler alert, they didn't make the list, but it's a very good band. Yeah. Um, it's a Latino so to, rancid right there, bro. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I did mess up though because I was a little intoxicated when I bought the shirt. And I called him Elvis Ramon. Thinking Let's of go. The Saturday Night Skit li live skit of Elvis Ramon instead of calling him Dude, Elvis. That's Ramon. awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. It is what it is. He, he he doesn't remember, but he once hung out with me at a warp tour for like ten minutes because you know I was the one kid into Left Alone there. And, Dude, that band. A bunch of kids are into the use, and I was there until Left Alone. Um, another one to mention that I just sort of rediscovered in this one was Choking Victim. The the one was it No Managers, No bosses, No Gods, No Managers, No Gods, No Man. Yeah, yeah. I checked that. I haven't not listened to that in a long time, and I really enjoyed uh, just kind of checking that out again. Now, the band that I really wanted to make sure we highlighted in this discussion. Well, I'll talk a little bit of rants and side projects and stuff, but a band I think of just like the Hellcat days, which for me were you know back in my high school days, and that was Tiger Army. I loved Tiger Army. I still do love Tiger Army. Don't go back to them as often for no specific reason other than like, hey, Robert, listen to Tiger Army more often. And I Well, there's, was, there is a specific reason you don't go back to them. Why? They're not a punk band. They're a rockabilly band, psychobilly band. So like, that's not yeah. what we normally listen to. And oddly enough, uh, the last like two out of the last three weeks, I've had to do special orders for people and they've been Tiger Army records at the shop. Yeah, and, and there's a there's a lot of Hellcat that specifically isn't punk as well. Like there's a lot of lots of it on on Hellcat. I didn't include a lot of that because I didn't really feel like it was fully in the theme of the list. But you know, uh, it is there. But of the Tiger Armies, Tiger Army Two, The Power of Moonlight. I was trying to make a judgment, like which one was the one I actually 
like the most. And I think it's well, that that's, one. That's the one. That's their better. That's their best album. Better. And I was thinking it was the third one, the one with the like the Ghost Tigers Arise. Streaks. I think so. Yeah. And yeah. I, I listened to it. I was like, no, it wasn't that one. And I okay. The EP so, is pretty good too. They have around the same time. I just want to mention the green and white one. Yes. No, it's very the good. Early, early beginnings or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Like the early year cuts or whatever. And I don't mean to interrupt you a bunch, man. This is gonna be a mm-hmm. long night, dude. We keep we're gonna be doing this to each other a lot, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh Tiger Army, in my opinion, Tiger Army 2 is the best album, but Tiger Army 3 has their two best songs on it. So it's like, do you want the heat or do you want like the consistency? I like consistency. So yeah. I go Tiger Army 2 is their best album. Yeah, no, it's, I, and I, yeah, I had to settle on that. I got to make a decision because I want, I want to talk about them this week. Okay. And a few more. And these are the more, um, I'll mention the more sort of some of the more mainstream ones. Well, one real quick is just one that I forgot about was Horror Props. I just hadn't listened to Horror Props in many, many years. Wait, Horror Props? Horror props. No, it's horror pops. Have I been saying that wrong for like 20 years? Yeah, it's H O R R O R P O P S. Horror pops. I've been telling people <laughs> I went to see them once. Like, where the hell? You're probably right. Like, no, no, I'm right. pretty, I'm right pretty confident. That. Hold on. Now, now you got me checking my so no, yeah, just, horror pops. Okay, yeah. well. Shows Have you been saying horror props? No one has corrected me. In 20 years. That's amazing. <laughs> I went. Yes, uh, it was on. Dude. In fact, we talked about it was the Rock Against Bush tour, and I think they opened oh. for like uh, it was like them, them and Rise Against for like these baby bands headlighting, and then uh, nice. the Unseen and Anti Flag were the headlighters, and, and there dude. was a few other the guy on a keyboard. And it was, I remember thinking of horror horror pops now, and I think like, well, it's cool. Like it looks like a like a Hellcat band and stuff, but they actually sounded. They have a lot of different sounds within their within that. Yeah, they've they got were, a lot of stuff going do. on. Yeah. Um, okay, and then that was the other. That was the last of the oddballs. Now, like the the main the mainstream ones, and I'll say these were Rancid Side Project or bands we tend to talk about. State of Discontent's probably my favorite Unseen record, and I realized I probably listened to the Unseen a lot compared to a lot of other bands in their scene because they were on Hellcat. I think that was probably the access point. I listen to, to the Casualties a lot too, but the Casualties Dude, I think are equally accessible. Like you can get to them very easy. There's a reason why the why, why the unseen is bigger than uh, the virus, the lower class brats, um, and the casualties. In my personal opinion, it's because they were on a bigger label that had better distribution. And uh, some people like that, some people don't. I personally like it because when you're a kid, what do you what do you, where do you go to get your music? Usually, the places that are easy to go mm-hmm. to. And so that band got kids into bands like the virus. And I'm not talking crap on any of those bands. They're all, right. those are like my uh, dude, uh, defiance. Like these are all bands mm-hmm. that I absolutely love. Uh, but the unseen got to be a bigger band and they were yeah, from and, Boston, which helped a lot. And for me, it was like, I liked all those bands a little bit. I liked the casualties more. Cause again, they were a little more accessible, but then I really got to dive into the unseen. I saw the unseen yeah. with Rancid and I saw the unseen on that rock against Bush tour. So I saw them with, mainstreamish you know underground bands as you know uh openers and then um i didn't have any interrupters on, records on there specifically but as a general water level of like the last 10 years of, of hellcat that's most of what hellcat has been doing has been promoting those albums and i would say yeah if i had to pick up one that i prefer the most because i i couldn't i think they're all pretty much kind of the same except for the fourth one yeah. I think is a little bit different but i like it for for what it is but i I used to not like the second one as much. And I think the second one has grown on me um, as time has gone on. That one I thought was what, like what's the, it called? The, is it Sing Loud, Sing Proud? I think it's no, that's Dropkick Murphys, bro. No, okay. So what am I thinking of? Um, say it out loud, maybe it's called. It's the one with the oh, one with say the it guy. out. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah over say, time, say it, I, I think it's say it loud or say it out loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah something like that. I, I like fight the like, good fight. Probably that one, I like fight the dude. They're kind of homogenized into one for me. It's hard to just they really those three really records. all their first three records. I put them all in the one playlist. So, so, so I did, I've been doing these clip videos from our other podcasts and I put yeah. up the, the one about the interrupters yeah. and this dude was like, this reeks of, of, of old man gatekeeper conversation. And I was like, it is. That's because literally it, what we do. <laughs> yeah. Because it kind of is, but like, but I was like, dude, relax. It's just a conversation. I also said, I like the band yeah. and I listened to them and I own the record. So let me clarify this for anybody that's wondering, <laughs> not, not in like a mean way. I like the interrupters. I listen to them. I own all of their albums on vinyl. I think I got one or two of them, double copies as I got different colors. Uh, and my wife's first show was the interrupters. So like, just because I have a weird feeling or like an observation, it doesn't mean that I don't like something or whatever. And yeah, dude, I'm absolutely the gatekeeper. I worked really hard to get that job. So leave me alone. Okay. Yeah, he, doesn't, he doesn't get paid very much for this either guys. At all. He works, I get he works paid in a lot in, of like, sweat. In, yeah, I get paid in insults, but uh, yeah, dude, not uh, worth very uh, much. Interrupters is definitely a 
a band that that I think deserves a lot of attention. I don't know mm-hmm. whether that's good or bad. Is just to be seen. I just, but I mean, they're a good band, and I'm learning a lot about them. I'm about to do a video on the Interrupters and like where they come from because mm-hmm. I've learned about some stuff recently. Because I never, I don't think I've ever said anything negative about them, have I? Other than like, no. I thought there's a little bit of something going on there, but like, I don't think I've ever like said nothing slanderous towards them. You, you I, I like cla- them, always, and you've always clarified that you really like their music too. Like, I genuinely do. Yeah, which is where the situation comes from is that I like their music a lot, but I have this weird feeling. I don't even know what the feeling is. It's just a strange feeling. But anyways, continue. Okay, and then um, a couple of a couple more. Um, so I, I listened to both of the Distillers records back to back because I knew like I'm gonna have that on the list, of course. I really love the second one. Um, the first one's really good, but I like Sing Sing Death House or is it Sing Death? I can see it in the background. Sing your, Sing Death House. I can see the background of your shot right now, but that is the one for me. Yo, like yeah, yeah, Sing is, Sing Death House. Yeah, that actually, is that that's is the funny. one of of their that two was albums. Not planned. <laughs> that's what you call native advertising, right there. If they were paying right. you. Um, and then I also did the same thing with the two Lars albums. Cause I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna have to make a judgment on these as well. Yeah, I like the I like the first one a little better. Um, I have the second one on vinyl. So in current time, I, I listen to the second one a little more because it just gets um, put on. And I like the, yeah. the gimmick he was trying to, not gimmick is in a fake way, but like the persona he was trying to go with on the second one. I think that's kind of cool. It only lasted one album and then he turned back into like soccer fan Lars like shortly well, thereafter. He, he, he had this like, he was going through an identity crisis because his life was falling apart and he was super into Motorhead and he was super into Harleys. I remember that version of Lars mm-hmm. because that's where I met him the most. Um We'll talk about it more in a, in a few minutes because I have a specific story I want to tell you. But like, yeah, it's it it is a persona, and, and I and I think there's a I think people that hate on that are silly because even if you're a punk rocker your whole life, there's going to be phases of things that you do different. And that and he's always been the same guy as far as I can tell. He's dressed a little different. Okay, dude, times change, clothes change, we all change a little bit. People just want to hate on him because he's successful and they don't like him because he's a you know famous skinhead. They just they hate it. And to me, he's that, always been into that stuff, dude. Every yes. record I've ever heard from Rancid, he's mentioned like uh, old '80s UK stuff and skinhead bands. His entire career, which I is don't why understand the hate. Lars is even if people don't like it, but for people like us who aren't stupid, Lars is the punk rocker for the fans. He's the punk rocker of the people. He is the yeah. most relatable guy we we talk about all the time. He, not not just he likes specific things that I also like that are outside of punk, but he just he's not afraid to express those likes of those kind of things, whether it be, you know, thrash metal. That's not exactly the most popular thing to talk about in punk or pro wrestling or his comic books or the other music that he likes or the other more obscure punk that he likes or mainstream punk that he likes a lot. Like Lars is very unapologetically li- uh, himself because I feel like he is very comfortable in that skin more well, so dude, than a lot of other punk rockers. That's why I get a lot of inspiration from him because I'm very much the same way. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of things that I do that people don't like necessarily, but I'm not going to change. Either you like me or you don't. And if you don't, it's okay. You don't have to. Like, does it hurt a little bit? I'm not going to act like it, that it doesn't sting if people say mean shit to me. Of course it does a little bit. But it comes with the territory. I'm either going to be able to accept that and move on from it or sit here and get all of my feelings. Sometimes I get upset and get in my feelings, but it's not often. I usually let things roll off my shoulders and people just think that if I respond at all that I'm actually mad. Read the responses, dude. I'm usually laughing. I'm not, I don't really care, man. And I yeah. think he's the same way. Uh, not that I'm anywhere close to as relevant as he is. I'm just saying like, it, it 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 gives me something to like oh well I, if he can do this then i can do this because he's got many 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 more thousands of people giving him crap than i do mm-hmm. so but yeah dude the uh, lars and the bastard records are good man um and then i just wanted to know uh i don't know one of the days i'll have to sit down and do an actual dropkick like album rankings but i have definitely listened to blackout way more than any other dropkick murphy's album and that was still out that was that was their second to last hellcat record i believe or warriors code um was the was the final one and then, and then lastly, this, if I would have done a ranking, this might've been number one or it might not have made the list because it's that kind of record, but Oh seven, a poet's life by, by Tim Armstrong. I love that album. I love every single one of those songs. Every single one of those songs has a unique story that you can get into that I can tell you about on most of them, because there are a lot of other stuff that relates to other rancid songs or stuff that was going on in the life. We get a sequel, in my opinion, to journey of the, to the end of the East Bay. The last song or second to last one, I can't, it's a, uh, Among the Dead, right? Or uh, Yeah, that's a great song. Yeah, I, f- I, I just feel like it's the sequel to Journey to the Journey to the End of the East Bay is part one of the Operation Ivy story. And that's kind of the part two and how Rancid forms. Like, you want to know the whole story of this whole ecosystem, kind of le- learn it in those two songs. A lot of people haven't even heard that record, so that's good for them to hear this. A lot of people that are watching this channel will have heard that, but a lot of people that stumble upon this that aren't really into punk won't have heard that record because it, it kind of came under the radar it's like an underground classic 
I found it myself, not um, like not in the moment, like not years later, but like a few months later, I just happened to like be, there were still like CD stores at the time. And I'm like, wait, Tim Armstrong had a record? Like, and I didn't hear it. And I thought, really? it, I thought it must've been like super obscure. And I wasn't completely unplugged at the time. You know what I mean? But I, it just like you said, and like you said, maybe it's better categorized as an agrolytes record that Tim is the lead singer on. Maybe that is the best categorization. So, because it's so much so in its own bubble. Yeah. With that record, I'll go ahead and start here. Yeah. That is one of my uh, honorable mentions is Tim Armstrong, A Poet's Life from 2007, like you said. Uh, the reason that I put it so high up is to even mention it on this list, because that means I've only got seven things I'm mentioning in total out of the entire life of that label. Uh, it's because it was not only Tim's only official solo project record, project record, excuse me, but it was also my introduction. So t t uh, Tim Armstrong, A Poet's Life, was my introduction to the Agrilites, a band that I personally hold in very high regard. Uh, I think they're the best to do it, period, the end. I think they're the best reggae band that I've ever heard, like in totality from beginning to end. They've got more songs that I like total. Now, have I listened to, to 10,000 reggae albums? No, I haven't. So this is something that if somebody hears this and goes, wait, blah, 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 just let me know in the comments. <laughs> well, no, no, like in seriousness, I say these kind of things yeah. to get people to tell me stuff in the comments. Like it's the best I've heard. Well, let me know some stuff I haven't heard yet, please, sincerely. But that album is important for a number of reasons. It is his first solo album. It's the introduction that a lot of people will get to the Agrilites because people know Rancid, the Agrilites are a far smaller band. So mm -hmm. That, al that album is extremely important, not to mention that it is from front to back, banger after banger after banger. It probably should have snuck in the top five. I had a really hard time with that one and my number five. They were flip-flopping just back and forth, back and forth. But A Poet's Life is an amazing album. I love it. I love the reggae. I love that he did an entire album of that kind of music because you know he loves that stuff. Uh, his vocal performance on it was really good. The... Uh, the uh, Production on the album is really good. It's a fantastic record. Their lyrical content is very personal. Like you said, it, it opens up a lot of things. Um, it, it's it's an amazing record, dude. It's an amazing it, record. It, in a lot of ways, I feel like it's almost also a not a sequel. Like it's got the same, but like it was the it was outside of the Transplants record, which is much more of a collaborative thing. It was the next Tim thing released after Indestructible. So I feel like the Headspace is a similar vein. That makes some sense. Of those, to, yeah, to some of those songs. Um, you say about the style though. I was waiting for like the punk song that first time I listened to it. Cause I just bought it. You know what I mean? It was like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I just bought it. And I was kind of waiting for the punk song and it never came. And I was okay with that though. Like I was, I just assumed there would be some punk rock on there because it's Hellcat, it's Tim. It's, all it's funny. It, it kind of just never came, you know, whenever I, so that record, I didn't become like surprised by a rancid release until after that. Um, I think it might've been right after that actually. What came after that with Rancid? Was it? It was D Domino's was in 09. So okay, never mind. So it was after Domino's then. You, I don't so remember. I was still. I was, came out like right around. I that. was still uh, pretty pretty uh, in the know, you know, in the know with mm -hmm. Rancid stuff, all the way up until Domino's, and then I fell out because I was trying to get my life together. It mm -hmm. had nothing to do with Rancid. It was just me. But like, I knew. I don't remember how I knew. I might have just read it somewhere. Like, hey, come in soon. This Tim Armstrong thing and, uh, you know, backing band, the Agrilites. So I didn't know much about the Agrilites, but I knew that, that they were a reggae band and I knew that they were the backing band on that record. So I, I was pretty confident that there wasn't going to be a punk song on there. I was still surprised when I listened to the whole record and it was just reggae after reggae jam. It was it was awesome, man. I really enjoyed it. And my wife listens to it. I've, she bought me a copy of that for an anniversary one year on vinyl. So I've got that on like the, the record store day white, the whatever the record store day one is. Yeah. I've got that uh, as a gift for my wife. Like that's an important record. That's a, it, it that's an accessible record, man. That, it definitely that, leads, everybody. I was going to say in my, I sneak in with normal crowds or when I don't try to clear out the bar with my access to the jukebox and I'm okay with other people being around, it definitely makes the list of stuff I put on and people just. What's know, your favorite song like, on there? I think that what uh, that last one uh, among the dead. Among the uh, dead. And then uh, that's everybody's. The is it, that's everybody's pick. Mine's into action. Yeah, that's that it's was the that most. Was, it's the most danceable that, song. That was the, just, the hit, I guess, of it. Like that was the one I feel like I saw. Oh, really? In places. Yeah. Uh, one of them was in a video game. I can't remember which one. I mean, I, I uh, probably was that one. That's the most was probably, like dancey and upbeat one. 
There's also a, a non-lyrical one, right? There's like a fully instrumental song. I think is it like oh, the man. last song or something? And it's just it's very soothing. It's very. It's soothing. been a while. I need to go back and listen to that in Which, its and that's entirety. Like, you know, so much of the aggro. Yeah, it's, and then there's the uh, is it inner city violence. I love that's how a good that song one too. Goes out, and I love the. I love all the you've seen of the female uh, backup vocalist in the entire album. Love it. it just dude. works really love well it. on that album. Well, yeah. that's where he really came into his own with his art style too. And he did a bunch of the high contrast videos. That's the first place he well, did all that. I got like a CD lot of that record came with the DVD. Yeah. Every single like, song. So just like they're releasing right now, right now they're releasing those black and white videos for their current. Record. This is yeah. This is the exception that, of that with all of it. Just every song was on there. So, who knows? I had I had the CD in my truck. I remember having that, but who knows how much of that I just saw on the DVD that I didn't actually listen to that I just watched over and over. Oh, probably a you lot. Know? And that was you know 07, so I was just living on my own for the first time. Didn't really have you. Oh, you got to the DVD player, you know, as you're just kind of going through things, and that was that. Dude, I, that I love that album. On. That DVD um, and the Hellcat DVD, honestly, were the two on the rotation a ton. Well, those helped me like get a lot of my friends in the bands because they would be. Not wanting to listen to music, they wanted to watch videos. So if I put those on, they would be interested in stuff I liked because of that. Uh, but yeah, let's same let's way, move MTV, on. Same way MTV grabs kids, like just in their same concept, but on a lower scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, pretty much. Uh, let's let's move on. We're getting uh, yeah, a little bit of time crunch here. Um, my other honorable mention is probably one you don't even care about. It is 1997, The Gadgets at Ease. Mm -hmm. There has never been another record that sounds like that, ever. It is amazing. It's so it's one of the last things that my dad bought for me before he died. So like, there's a lot of personal love in that. And when I was doing my live stream on Sunday, I did a Hellcat appreciation stream, and we just went through Hellcat songs. And somebody jumped on the podcast or on the stream rather. And while I was playing the gadgets, they were like, "Oh my goodness, I was just playing this in my car." The odds of that have got to be so slim, dude. Especially but ha that ha Jeez. have you, dude? That's what I'm saying. Have you ever heard the, that album? To me, they're just a Hellcat. They're they're a band that that's, I knew was on Hellcat. You know what I mean? I, I've You've never, never heard really, that record. I've never really engaged with it. No. You need to go listen to that, dude. It's the most. It's like, like, it's like a. It's on. It's on Spotify. It's like a. It's like a ska band, but with like mod rock influences. It's the only band I've ever heard that I thought reminded me of the Gadgets even a little bit was Catbite. When I first heard Catbite, okay. I was like, "Oh my goodness." This reminds me of the gadgets, and it's not the same, but it's they've got a lot of similarities. So, yeah, those are my two honorable mentions. Um, let's start with my top five. Let's go five. I'm gonna cheat a little bit, dude. My five yeah. is two records in one, and I'll explain why. Uh, number five is Lars and the Bastards, it's both of his records, and it's because I, I literally put a bunch of notes, I had to do a whole other page, like rip it out, throw it up, because I couldn't, it was too many scratch outs. Because that those records were driving me nuts. I couldn't figure out which one mattered the most. And I think that the first record is the better record. The second record has the most influence. It's got the most, it was the bigger album. Uh, mm, it, they, they toured more on it. It probably sold more copies. Um, but they both have different things going for them. Because they're slightly different albums. It's like mm -hmm. you can watch him change and him go through some things just by listening to those two records. And I kind of lump them in as one record together personally. Most of the time, I don't even really know. I, I know I said that the first one's a better record, but dude, I'm telling you, I listened to the second one and I don't know that that's true. There's a little corny stuff in the lyrics a couple of times in the second record, but their second record is better. It's got more like uh, the songs are better written. The production's a little bit better. The vocals are a little bit better. The guitar's a little tighter and a little bit better solos. But the first record is like more of a punk rock, gritty punk rock record. So it just depends on what you're looking for, I guess. The first The first record is like, the stuff they should have put on Rancid 2000, I think all got put on the, uh, on the Lars album. Because right. like, no, no, for got, real. It, it's got the vibe of the Rancid 2000 vibe, which is done way better. Um, in that's, a lot of, dude, a lot of instances. I'm so glad you said that because I honestly think that that's what it is. As I look at that, <laughs> it's like, Oh, this is what they were. They should have done. Like Rancid 2000 was like what they were trying to, to do was the Lars record, but Lars was probably writing these songs for this record. Mm -hmm. And so he was giving them material and it was like his B-side stuff. Because I think like Dead American could totally go on Rancid 2000. Like that sounds like if you told me that song was on yes. Rancid 2000 or the, uh, the, the the Vietnam song, like well, those just lyrically, thematically sound um, like Rancid. Now, To Have or To Have Not, which is one of my all-time favorite songs, mm. that to me is like, if if Rancid was more Lars's band than like than Tim's band, I feel like that's a Rancid song then because that is uniquely Lars. Now, do you love the last song on the second album, the one where he's just kind of talking? 
uh, Mary. Oh, to the yes. I Isn't love that, awesome? that song. I lo- dude, <laughs> love it, dude. Love I it. I listen to it on repeat. I annoy people with it because like, are you supposed to a guy and talk about like what it's like, like being semi-famous? I'm like, yeah. I, I love it because it's so ridiculous because it's so well, ridiculous and it's, and, it's, and it's likely true. The ridiculousness so, like, of the fame of punk rockers, I think, is very interesting. You are famous yes. enough that two people like me and you in different states can do a podcast on you 10 years later. But at yeah. the same time, other than your unique look, you can pretty much go anywhere. No one knows who the hell you are. Like you're right. also not you're also not rich necessarily, but you're very well known in certain and I think there's a lot of that contrast. And he's, got, but, he's got enough money to have a nice car and a house, but not enough money to drive a Lamborghini. You know, eating out of dumpsters and dated pop right. stars, but like, yeah, well, like, you've done all those things. I mean, look at like what we do. We do YouTube and my, I have a relatively large channel on the other end of this, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I nobody knows who I am and if I got 270,000 people, nobody would know who I was still. So yeah. I can only imagine like I don't remember where I was going with that. I had a point. I lost it. Anyways, yeah, Lars's life has got to be pretty strange, I would think, because he does have places that he can go and not be left alone and but then otherwise can you imagine like having a down day where you want some people to recognize you because you're kind of like bummed out about something or depressed and you go walking around and nobody gives a shit? That's got to be, and especially like if you're large, because let's face it, most 52 year old dudes don't have the word skunks tattooed on their forehead either. So, right. You know what I mean? Like clearly they know there's something up with you, but they probably just think you're a criminal and not right? like and- one half of one of the biggest bands ever. And he's and he and it's like if it was Tim, he wouldn't care at all. Like he would be more bothered by people knowing who he was. Mm-hmm. But like Lars is probably like you know because and look, dude, people can say what they want. Anything that I say about Lars, dude, I love that guy, man. That, that dude is the jam, bro. So uh, everything I'm saying about him is with with love and reverence, man. He's a good dude. He's he, I've talked to him on the phone a few times. He's very nice. Uh, you know, like a, a bucket list thing would be to get him on the podcast. It may not ever happen, but it, it, I do believe that it's a possibility. So. Uh, yeah large large is the jam uh number four you mentioned it dude it is uh sorry number four is from 1999 choking victim no gods no managers dude that record so okay i was trying to decide if i wanted to put choking victim or leftover crack on on the list because I think that that group of people is largely the same. Get them confused at times. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of their songs, you'll get confused which album it was. But Choking Victim is the better, it's got the better record. Now, speaking on Hellcat, that record is also another one of those things where it changed stuff. After that record came out, things changed. They, we wouldn't have days and days without a band like Choking Victim. They wouldn't exist. Uh, it made crust punk accessible it combined elements of ska punk and black metal which had never been done uh, at least to my to my knowledge uh you know a, a, a very interesting vocal stylings they didn't hide from their like you know uh, addiction issues and the, and the fact that they were kind of crummy people uh whenever it came out that what, how do you say his name is it uh stiz or Sh- whatever the dude's name is the singer it's let me try to read it out. I, uh Sturgeon uh, is it Sturge? Yeah, Sturgeon. Whatever his name is, man. I've I've met the dude a bunch of times. I can never remember how to say his name. Anyways, when it came out that he was kind of a scummy dude, nobody was surprised. Like it, it's it's weird, man, because they're, they're like a weird band. I've seen them live a few times. I've seen them live. I saw them live in a house, and there was like 50, 60 people there. But I also saw them at Emos in Austin with like I don't know fifteen hundred people. I don't know how many it was. It might have been seven hundred, but it was a lot of people. Right. So I've seen him in two different environments, like completely different. And they were like the exact same people. Right. But he got kind of weird. And he was like, I don't know, man, that album is definitely a turning point in punk rock music, in my opinion. That is like, you know, you'll have the timeline and you'll have these little blips where something happened and you go, okay, well, things change from there on. Now you have this other web that goes out and things go this way and that way. This is one of them. And so when this band happened, this album happened uh it, it changed us plus 500 channels is just a fantastic song crack rock steady is one of my favorite songs of all time uh dude there's so many good songs on that record plus it came out right around my birthday so i was psyched that it came out in march um but it's also a 42 minute song uh 42 minute record for 13 songs that tells you a lot there's a lot of punk albums that are nowhere near that length that are mm-hmm. this many songs or more 
And so, like, there's, I don't know, it's a, dude, War Story. Man, this album is so good, dude. It, yeah, bro, it earned his spot. Uh, you, you, you were talking about it earlier. What, what was your thoughts on it? Because I didn't think, I don't think you would have had it in your top five. No, and to me, it's, it's the, it's a few things. One, choking victim is always like you talk about the gatekeeping. That's like the secret code, right? Like, oh, you okay. know that you, you know who choking victim is. Like, okay, you're cool. We can, uh, you're, you're in the club. To me, it's the, the, it's the fusion of it's exactly what you're saying. It's the way they use the ska. Like we talked about it before, like that ska hardcore. Yeah. In that in that kind of way, and uh, what's the band you're always mentioning? Um, Boston's? No, not Boston's. Anyway, we'll get stuck in it. But like, it's that same kind of vibe where, like, it's ska that sounds dangerous, and a lot of the a lot of oh, the ska, authority. Yeah, maybe that's what I was thinking of. And they don't exactly sound like it, but it's that kind of no that kind of vibe of like yeah. dangerous ska. And it's funny because a lot of the other Tim Armstrong ska stuff is almost the opposite of that. The other, all the other Tim Armstrong ska stuff is like the ska you bring your your mom home to, whereas choking victim yeah. is completely um completely different. Well, like it sounds like a gang. Like it's it's hard to explain what I mean by that, but it sounds like it sounds no, like it's a, it's its own yeah. thing. It, that's yeah. what, that's the, that's my whole point. That's why it deserves to be on this list. It's its own thing, dude. It changed music. And so, mm -hmm. like, I mean, hell, dude, Ransom has a song called Brad Logan. Where do you think he's from? Oh, he's from a lot of things. But, like, he was also in, I think he was in Choking Victim. Or Leftover Crack. Might have been both. I can't remember. But Brad Logan was, like, part of that musical group, right? So, I mean, damn, now I have to look it up. Is uh, is Leftover Crack on your list at all? I think. No. They're coming up. They were no, you know, no, because because it was either going to be them or Choking Victim, but the, the, the Choking yeah. Victim album is is objectively better. And shout out to Hellcat, I believe. Okay, he was in Leftover ones, Crack, so my apologies. They were the only ones willing to put out the Leftover Crack album, I believe, um, like two thousand one. Oh, uh, really? There was there's some controversy related to that album coming out, and like no other label wanted to touch it. And Tim was like, "Oh, that's that's our stuff. Come right here." Uh, and, and Mediocre so America. That. Maybe in like 2001, 2000. Yeah, that's, that's, that was from 2001, I think. And then yeah. they had Fuck World Trade later on. The, well, they had an album that came out on 9 11, I want to say, or like right around then. And like it was, there was like a controversy about that, about people trying to get it pulled and stuff too. I would, yeah, I, I wish I had more information the lyrics are, on it. Some... But like, I know Tim, it was like Tim was the only label that was going to put out that uh, the, um, the leftover crack album. And I just, I uh, wanted to mention that so we didn't completely have that. That's a, that's a very Hellcat band as well. Um, the same well, way, you know, choking. So is. before we move on, I do want to mention that I find it extremely hilarious that uh, they left Hellcat because Hellcat got distribution through whoever it was uh, with Epitaph, right? When Indestructible, all that mm. stuff was happening. That's why Leftover Crack chose to to jump ship. But he's like the most rock star dude out there. Like, I'm. It doesn't make sense to me. It's like this fake punk rock thing that he was trying to prove a point that that Hellcat wasn't punk rock enough for him. I don't know. I found that really, really weird. And if I'm if I'm misremembering that or misquoting any of that stuff, dude, please let me know. But I think that's exactly what happened. But I can tell you for a fact that he's like the rock star type. I've met yeah, him I'm, a lot. I'm going through their Wikipedia page. There's a lot that happened there. Uh, oh, dude. it was actually um, Meteor Generica was the al Meteor Generica was the album that came out originally. The album title was Shoot the Kids at School. Um, this this happened in 1999, right after Columbine had happened. And well, so, 1999 was was uh, Choking Victim. 2001 was the Leftover Crack record. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm referring to. The, the Leftover Crack. Record. That's that's that was the controversy though, as far as because the, bro, you should listen to some of the lyrics that he's written in both of those albums. But I think the Choking Victim one has something about. Uh, a violent situation. Mm -hmm. I can't. I don't even want to say because it, so it'll get me demonetized yeah. or, or taken down on on YouTube. But like, he talks about that kind of stuff. Like, he doesn't care. He'll do that to your kid or something. It's wild, bro. Like, hit the lyrics. Like, and look, dude. Some of it's super edge lordy, but some of it makes sense. And I believe in freedom of speech, so I think you're allowed, you should be allowed to say that. That doesn't mean it's not gross. But uh do I like the band? Have I worn their shirts and have? Yeah, I have patches of them. I'm about to put one on my hoodie, like maybe tonight. Uh, but I prefer Choking Victim. I do like both bands. To me, they're kind of the same thing. And we got them confused um, but, in this conversation. So that, but it, that but how much for conversation's sake, what one do I think was the album? It was Choking Victim, No mm -hmm. Guys, No Managers, 1999. Uh, yeah. Any more a great, comments A great on album, that? too. Just a great it album. It is a very, in very good like, album. That's why I, I didn't think I was going to. I was, I, you know, I like Choking Victim. No, I didn't think I was going to put a pin in it until I heard that album. I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, this was really good. 
So, number three, the third greatest album on Hellcat, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, 2005, The Unseen, The State of Discontent. The reason that I put this album as high as I did, because I think originally it wasn't even in the top five, and I, it just kept getting higher and higher because it is the probably the biggest street punk album of all time like people say rancid are a street punk band and i don't agree with that they're just a punk band to me like a punk they rock just band. look like a street ba- street punk band they yeah just, and i they mean do. they've got some songs that i guess could qualify but they're more like a punk rock and roll band like that's the way i look at them street mm. punk is more like what Lars used to look like and what the unseen the casualties the charged hair defiance the virus all these bands with like the street, it's a street, it's a very specific look. Crust but, punks making music, yeah. It's like it's it's well, that's the crust punks are different than street punks, so I would disagree with that. But it's the biggest street punk album of all time. It just is. It's the mm. it, oh man, I don't know. It might be up there with like the casualties diehards or something, but anyhow, it is one of the top of all time. It's the one that got the unseen to be who they were, and it it it, it opened a lot of doors for bands of that type. And it got a lot of kids that wouldn't have heard that kind of music into that kind of music uh, much easier, much quicker, much younger, I would imagine. But it's it's also a really, really, really good album. And it borderlines on like a hardcore sound at points. It's a it's their best album, in my personal opinion. Um, but I do think all their albums are really great. So uh, it's definitely the most widely distributed street punk album, I think, of all time. I guess that's because, probably the way I should have put it. Yeah, because I don't know if Die Hard's like. Like shoot, that's that's hard to know. Is Die Hard's technically a bigger album? But I'm saying discontent probably from raw numbers because of the distribution network that it had, and Casualties had Psycho and Dummy, so it's not like yeah. they had nothing. Um, but true. yeah, I I would uh, and the Casualties are really big internationally as well. I would say that's probably the the most widely distributed. And then you have like you had like a quality video that was like on blank TV and Fuse right. and all that. Like it was as mainstream as like Street Punk could probably ever hope to be, other than being filtered through like a Rancid or something. Right, and I and I guess I guess I guess the biggest is probably the wrong word for me to use. Uh, I will say one of the top. Street it might punk be. Records it, of it, all time. I think I think it might be. That, that's funny to think about because you don't think of street punk as necessarily big. So it's hard. Like, right. So what are, what well, that's are why I think this record records. is so yeah. important. That's why I think it's so important, and that's why I think it deserves to be on this list in the place that it's in because that kind of music, it it never reached those heights. Even the casualties at their biggest, I don't think were bigger than the unseen maybe a little bit maybe I don't, yeah I, and i don't know like i don't have a strong opinion on that but i i don't know because it's because say ever since you've been saying that though that has challenged my perception of like the casualties being the biggest like known you know band from that from that yeah. scene but yeah it might it might because of this it might be this album might be the difference of what kind you know of it's pushed them over the top What's crazy, I'm trying to not talk over you. My apologies, dude. Anybody yeah. that's getting irritated, I'm sorry. I'm really trying not to do it. We're Digital just really excited. It, yeah. it is very hard to not. Plus, there's a small lag, so I'm not quite sure when you're done and when you're not. Anyways, th- one of the things that made me say that it was the biggest is such a weird thing. But I, I, I sold patches for a while online, and I had a casualties patch and an unseen patch. And they were both about the same quality, both the same size, both the same price. And I sold way more of the unseen than I did the casualties. And I think that's in my head. And that's what made me say that. So if I'm wrong, don't be so upset. It's just a, a, a thought. There's like interviews in alternative press with the unseen. Like I never saw the casualties, you know, being interviewed for a magazine. Oh, like they probably they were. But I'm just they probably like, probably were. Yeah. Maybe though, too, it's okay. The casual, the unseen are slightly younger than the casualties. So well, that's that might play kinda, into the two where, where, like you might say, yeah, punk was fairly large in the nineties. And a lot of our bands we talk about had their big thing, but pop punk and not that the unseen are pop punk, but the accessibility to punk, I think is way bigger. Like in the two thousands when warp tours and that kind of thing, uh, there's like four different music channels. So the, the, the ground, and that's when the unseen are literally with one of the biggest bands from that genre, you know, on their label, uh, with that's, rancid. And so it, you know, it plays into it. I would love that's for, kind of that's something in the though. comment section, please like sound off honestly about that. Like, I think that's a pretty good debate casualties versus unseen just in general and it got me thinking way all kinds of different parameters on it and maybe if the casualties had come out at the same time and had the same kind of releases at the as the unseen and then also got on the same label we could see if there's a major difference but yeah just based on just based on when they came out the age of the people because like look at the casualties now david tejas is singing for them and they're rocking and rolling but mm-hmm. like you don't hear about them the way that you used to hear about the unseen yeah and it's it's strange so i could be wrong 
But when I was young, the, the the band was the unseen. And when they got signed to Hellcat, I was stoked. But I know a lot of people that weren't. And so, you know, I could be – I was just a Hellcat fanboy. It is what it is, bro. I'm not even – That'd tripping. be a good forearm <laughs> tattoo, by the way, is that unseen logo. I always thought there was a good way to make a forearm tattoo out of that unseen. Dude. The one with, like, the web and stuff. Yeah, there's a – you know, that's from a movie. It's a horror movie logo. Oh. Well. That actual logo <laughs> from a movie. I would, uh, Of course, I would know that. Mm-hmm. It, it's right, better than the casualties font that, uh, but casualties unseen and rancid definitely led my notebooks in weird fonts that I would write stuff on in the middle of school in like 2004. Especially rancid, bro. That that one is so easy to the draw. Straight, the straight letters and stuff. Yeah, that was always everywhere. Um, well, we've only got two left, and then we'll jibber jabber for a few minutes before we go. The second most important record in Hellcat history, in my personal opinion, is from 1998. It is Dropkick Murphy's Do or Die. There is a bazillion reasons why I would put this so highly ranked. I bet you're wondering what my number one is. Um, so don't say it yet because you might guess it. But okay, so Dropkick Murphy's Do or Die. In my personal opinion, it's their best album. It's it's start, So it started two careers simultaneously without even realizing it because when Mike McClogan left the band, he – eventually started the street dogs which is a band that i personally would rather listen to than the dropkick murphys most of the time because i like that more blue collar rock and roll sound than i do the celtic stuff and i'm irish so like the irish mm. stuff is great i love it i love flogging molly i love all that stuff but dropkick murphys that album made because somebody was mad because i was arguing for oi being pretty accessible a while a, a couple weeks ago yeah and saying that that, that dropkick murphys and flogging molly were as accessible as anything else that punk rock was and I stand by that because when I say punk rock, I don't mean MGK or Blink-182. And I'm not talking crap. I just don't. That's not what I mean. I mean like punk rock. I think Dropkick Murphys are as big as anybody that's ever been a punk band. Um, but that's, that's, I think that's, you know, whatever. People can disagree. It's okay. I'm not, I, I'm not uh, an authority on any of this. I just have an opinion about it. But, but, but do or die. Like start, like think about what that set off, dude. Think about the things that we've got because of that record. I don't think Flog and Molly would be as big as they were if it wasn't for that record. I don't think that we would have bands like, um, what was that uh, Scottish band? Um, the Real McKenzie's wouldn't be as big as they were if it wasn't for Dropkick Murphys because they were the first punk band to really have a platform and have like bagpipe stuff and be Irish and be from Boston. Like that was to that degree. That stuff existed before then. But it didn't have that kind of platform. And then they took, because they're good dudes, bro. So they took these other bands on the road with them. And they got a lot of people exposure. Then you have stuff like Boston to Berkeley, where you have Rancid and Dropkick touring together. One of my favorite shows of all time was Dropkick Murphys. I, I think it was post uh, McClogan, though. It was an Al Bar Dropkick Murphys. But, I mean, dude, even, even, even the fact that we got Al Bar from the Bruisers to sing for them, and we got a bunch of classic records with him. Like, that wouldn't have happened without this record. And this record is a banger of a record from front to back it is awesome there's not a bad song on it and i think the production is really good and it introduced somebody like me to the world of oi music and it let me understand that there's a difference between that and punk because up mm. until then i really didn't get it you know what i'm saying so what are your thoughts on dropkick murphy's do or die i know you prefer blackout as like just the dropkick release yeah so now we, we talked about this on our, our 98 one where it's like oh it, this one might be the one that i would pick as the even though i just like I have just so much extreme bias towards Blackout just because it's yeah. just, I, it, it just when I got it. Um, plenty of the classic songs also set the template. Um, and what this did and what, so, and what, and what I mean is um, lyrically as well, because like yes. my biggest thing politically that has held in my whole life is honestly labor rights. Like that's my one issue that like I can, and I to me it's the most accessible I could talk about with you, with someone else, a poor person. It's a very accessible issue. I don't know that that exists necessarily among young punk rockers without this album, without the Dropkick Murphys making that like their tent pole kind of thing. Cause a lot of other political bands pick a lot of other stuff and I'm not like downgrading or saying one thing is more important than the other, but they had a specific lane, which the cover of this album sort of speaks to that many of the songs on it. And it kind of became a thing like, you know, the way they like Goldfinger, like animal rights is kind of their thing or whatever, you know, different bands have different, you know, causes that they champion. And I was like, huh. There's not, there wasn't this in all of culture. There's just not a lot of talk about that as a political issue, unless it's like something literally to get votes in the moment. And I think that well, concept of working class, they really did a lot to really get that within punk rock. And maybe like, well, what is it that we represent in punk? And I think working class really is 
the common thread of like you know yeah. what, what type of music is punk for it's work and yeah we talk about it, it does come from the suburbs a lot but it's also very much working class music at its at its soul so so my, my response to that would be that the, your comment uh tells me how much you haven't really been into oi music mm-hmm. not in like a negative way just that you just never really went down that pathway i guess real super deep um if because, i remember rancid wasn't in the oi band i didn't really check it out that much you know what i'm saying so like i concept, have been yeah. into it not not super deep but like even back when this came out i listened to this and then i wanted to hear more bands like this so i started listening to them i just didn't unnecessarily differentiate the two but working class stuff was in music in punk rock it was just in a different segment of it mm-hmm. but they got the platform which then let other bands get some success and it became something that is now just kind of in punk rock music like mm-hmm. you get stuff like the mighty mighty boston's later albums anything uh a uh, street dog stuff. Um, you got uh, avoid one thing, which is another member of the Boston's. Oddly enough, you've got uh, True Intentions from Houston, which has got members of the Street Dogs in it. Uh, I mean, there's so many little. This record has done so much, man. There's little bitty spider webs of connectivity from this record all the way from Boston to Houston, Houston to California. It's pretty insane, man. Uh, and I do like your wording. The template. It's had a template for that kind of music, and um, I do believe it opened a lot of doors for a lot of a lot of a lot of because a lot of oi guys they don't necessarily care for punk stuff too much they're mm-hmm. more into like a rock and roll sound than a street punk sound and i think that's where it starts to veer off different um if you listen to uh like conservative military image like even even when they were playing live he's like man punk rock i don't like punk rock we don't play punk and i was thinking to myself like if you let somebody hear this and say what kind of music <laughs> is it they would sell you punk rock so yeah. and I mean, he was being a little cheeky right but there is a difference there and uh, uh it's it's hard to distinguish sometimes but i think it's really cool that this album came out and helped give that specific sound a place to be in, in an audience that might not have gotten it. And I, I think that's really cool. And yes, the lyrical content was, I, I come from a very working class family or mother, mm-hmm. my mom, my dad was never around. My mom worked very hard physical labor jobs as a young woman. And I'll start crying talking about it, bro. My mom, I was just at her house a few minutes ago, helping her with some things. And she couldn't even walk up the stairs because her leg won't bend because of all the years that she spent getting in and out of a big giant step van. She's only five foot and half an inch tall. So like, uh, you know, getting up in this big giant Frito-Lay truck for 20 years and then a, a Lance Foods truck for 15 more, uh, you know, she that kind of music really resonates with me. And um, Dropkick Murphys, I heard them and it was like, I, I remember riding a Metro bus Let's see, where was I at? I was going, I, if you're not from Houston, you won't understand what I'm saying. So I was riding from just outside the city to inside the city to go to work. And I remember I have this very clear memory of having the do or die record. It had been it come up missing and I didn't know where it was. And this is a couple years after the album came out. I think this was about, yeah, this is probably about 2005. So I was an adult at this point. I didn't know where my CD was, but I had like a burned copy of it. I got off the bus. I don't know why I'm telling you this right now. It just popped in my head. I got <laughs> off the bus. It was because it connects number three and number two together. I mm-hmm. got off the bus to go in this record store. I wrote, that's what it was. I was going to the record store after work, and I had to ride the bus to get there. And it was this big, giant record store. And I walked in, and I was like, hey, do you guys have punk stuff? They're like, yeah. And they showed me where it was at, and I'm looking. And I find Dropkick Murphys. I'm walking down the aisle, and they have this little bitty section. It says uh, new releases, and then it said like, you know, rock, uh, metal, pop, rap. And then over here, it's got like one little row that says punk. And it's got like three new albums. And one of the albums was that Unseen record, The State of Discontent. And I used to live in South Houston. And I, I was like, what is this, man? And I didn't know that they were putting that album out. So I got it. And dude, I'm telling you, man, I wore that album out. Anyways, Dropkick Murphy's Do or Die from 1998. One of the best records ever. And I think it's a very important record for the success of Hellcat Records because it came out really early on in in that label's life and it could have absolutely helped them. It probably did help uh, keep that label around, I would think. Mm -hmm. Well, think about it. Like, um, Dropkick Murphys, as you're saying, like, what a big punk band they are. Of any band that's ever been considered or categorized as punk that, like, maybe never made it quite to, like, TRL, they are definitely the biggest band. Like, I think they were probably bigger than Rancid ever got. They're probably, even though Rancid actually did reach those heights. They're bigger than everyone that's not the Green Day offspring, like, that 
category any like yeah. anything that's not that category they're definitely the biggest the biggest band and because like by the time they left hellcat right in 06 major labels have kind of died so yeah i always say like say what you want about drop they're a hellcat band they still tour with hellcat that is a hellcat band they're very I agree. Much, you can say they oh they're not a punk band either, but you know what they are a hellcat band they're still a skinhead band they're an oi band and i think that there's no street punk stuff in a scorsese film so i mean like <laughs> say what you want dudes when i heard that in that movie a lot of people were were like gatekeepy about it i was I, stoked dude i was me. so freaking excited <laughs> oh you were I, gatekeepy? I, not because like it, it the scenes are awesome and like i hate that song shipping it to boston just straight up oh i love that song um, and it is because like that just and it's not it is gatekeeping because that be, that was everyone's dropkick murphy's i'm like no, no no they have all this other cool stuff and it, I didn't like how it got reduced. I felt like so to that to that and the stupid Red Sox, and just not only because I hate the oh, Red Sox, I hate but, the Boston Red Sox, but, but also it's oh. like it's like that that was what Dropkick Murphys were to like the public, and I was like, no, they're a really cool band with all these like great songs, and I, I kind of got annoyed with that like very much. I don't want to be a, a super hypocrite here and act like I'm not gatekeepery on things because I absolutely am, and I think it's mm-hmm. hilarious that people get so mad about it. But for some reason, when I heard that song. I was so proud of them. I was like, man, this has got to feel amazing because that song really did like kind of that changed a lot of stuff for punk rock, man. Like, I mean, think Mm -hmm. about what that song really did, dude. Like it got big, bro. Like it's still a pretty big song. I wonder how many listens it's got on Spotify. You think it's got half a billion yet? No, no no way. It's, it's it's up there. I don't, I don't really know this. It's got, let's say, let's say, let's say, let's say 10 million. I wonder, if it's, I wonder if it's got 10 million, half a billion. That's a lot. Uh, let's see. Holy crap. I was closer than I thought. 274 million streams. It's closer to half a billion than it is 10 million. Dude, many- I am absolutely shocked right now. Yeah, that's what you do, man. You you just you you pray to your Brady statue and uh, you go on the way to Fenway and you pop in that song, and that's what you do every day. I mean, you know, it is what it is. Uh, it definitely I, leads in me being obnoxious at sporting events, like putting my fist in the air when they do the part because they play yeah. it. They don't have to be in Boston. They play it at like every sporting event. That's oh yeah, that. I would imagine. I would imagine they play it a lot. Um, it's funny too because that album. I mean, that song was so many years after. Dude, that was a full almost eight years after that other album. Man, that's yeah. a whole different band. That's like a culmination of what started there with what you talked about right so crazy man but yeah do or die is a fantastic record that i i have a a lot of love for but but i think there's one record that is more important to hellcat records than dropkick murphy's do or die that is not a rancid record of course Mm -hmm. and that is sing sing death house i think that's the most important record on hellcat outside of rancid material and there's a number of reasons for that. I think that the Distillers are probably the best, maybe not the biggest, but the best female fronted punk band of all time. I think that Brody is almost as revered as Tim Armstrong to a lot of people. Uh, I think that that record is also kind of perfect. It's, I mean, it's a, it's, it might be the best. It's like the best Rancid record not written by Rancid. And that's probably going to piss some people off. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I don't know who actually wrote that and wrote all the songs. It might have just been Brody. I don't know. But there was a lot of influence there, clearly. But it's when that record came out... the better parts of Rancid 2000. Let me just throw that in there. Like, if Rancid 2000 was better, it might kind of sound like that. Yeah. And so, like, I mean, I'm, you're not wrong. And the Sing Sing Death House changed music for me. Because before that... I didn't really care about female fronted bands. Like I didn't have like a problem with them. I, I just was like, mm-hmm. whatever. When I heard that record, like when I heard their first album, I really liked it, but something about sing, sing death house really changed like my like opinion. Cause I saw the distillers play live before sing, sing death house came out and I really enjoyed them. And I was like, bro, that girl there. Woo. And like, you know, yada, yada, yada. We all had our crush on her. Right. Mm-hmm. But then sing, sing death house came out and it it's, it's, it's kind of perfect, man. It's it's the production is amazing. The songwriting is amazing. The performances on it are amazing. Uh, I don't know, man. I really feel like that is outside of rancid albums. I think that my list is pretty, pretty well representing of all things. Hellcat. 
uh, man, I don't know, dude. I think that there's not many records out there that I think are better than Sing Sing Death House. I, I, it's weird, dude, because I don't listen to it as often as I feel like I should maybe after talking about it right now, but every song on it is great. And I think it was at a time where punk was peaking. I think that's like mm-hmm. the peak of punk rock was like that two or three years around then. Yeah. Maybe even with their first record, but definitely with like the Hellcat stuff, the Unseen, Lars and the Bastards, Dropkick doing things, Rancid doing stuff, A Poet's Life. Like Hellcat really is like the peak of punk rock. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, but, it's, it's at its peak when it's the most viable time to probably be a in a punk rock band, even more so than the 90s because all that had been flushed out and figured out. And then yeah. like, like think of how big this album, you know, is relative, like got them signed uh, to a major was got them uh, like they were touring with no doubt and garbage on this record. Like think about that, a Hellcat band. And That's it's not, insane. And it's not, it's not because Brody's that, yes, she got on the tour because they are a female fronted band, but those are big bands that are going to have whoever they want on that. You know, like, you know, Gwen Stefani's not going to, not going to tour with some crappy, you know, punk band as their opening band, just to, just to be nice to, you know, old friends from back in the neighborhood. Like, no, they were they were legitimately put on that stage. I think Fat Mike has said, we talked about this before, it's the most money at the time Brett had ever contributed to an album. Oh, um, really? As far as, like, they just they knew it was going to be good. They knew it was going to be big. Um, the packaging is amazing. You've got, I would miss, the cover art is good. It's got the old English font, uh, which you and I, I think, both really love. The oh, songs yeah, are amazing, though. Um, specifically, Crazy Young Pilling and Sing Death House the song city of angels is great um city i am a revenant is my favorite i am a revenant is probably my favorite very very good song uh, you know oh yeah look at this about, yeah i remember when it rained and it rained for you oh my god uh, i can, I can so listen good. to that forever so the person um i talk about it all the time well, that's a looking at that back as a flashback from the old cd bro i'm telling um, you i'm about to open it up because i've never this is a i had to rebuy oh, this because I, I damaged my other one <laughs> a live unboxing the person that got me into punk rock i always said it was a female it was it was my girlfriend at the time who was like just into this weird music and i knew what punk was but i didn't really like know you know punk to me was you know green day or whatever and uh she was kind of into rancid and then i got really into rancid and then she's like well you know like my favorite band is fronted by uh that guy's wife right and i was like no i don't know what you're talking about she'll check this out and i was like it's huh. cool because she's this cool punk rock chick that's like loud and you know it's just, just like not exactly getting into fights everywhere, but you know, we'll make her opinion heard. It's a very like assertive woman like that. It's kind of why I liked her, I think. And then I was Wait, like, who's oh, the girl or Brody? Both. But I'm saying there was okay. a connection because I was like, oh, that's like you if you were famous. I used to say, you know, that was exactly like you talk about what there really wasn't like and I talked about it in my video I did on them. Every other girl, even if it was like uh Gwen or one of them, they were still kind of like the typical, yeah. That's how the CD was too, with the big that had that gun thing on there. They were always still like, I think the typical pop princess, like even Gwen Stefani, even though she's a little bit different, she's still kind of like a pop princess. I think Brody was the first one to really not sort of have that, have that aspect. Maybe she looks like a, like a modern Joan Jett or something, but she very much looked and felt like something that was out of the Hellcat scene that was, you know, front and front Well, and she center. was, she was Courtney Love for like punk rockers, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, and she even sounded a lot like her kind of, to me. Uh, yeah, and, and you say you didn't like the follow up album because you thought you thought it went too alternative and too oh, whole. Terrible! Sounded. I hate Coral Fang. That album sucks. That it, oh, bro, that album's terrible. Um, in my in my opinion, like I, if somebody else likes it, and thinks it's amazing. That's cool too. I, I don't understand why people get they, so bothered by one. They wouldn't opinion. have had that though if they didn't have this. They wouldn't have had. They got to be. It didn't last for them. Uh, their infrastructure really wasn't. There's a lot. There was a whole chapter dedicated to them in Dan Ozzy's book. Uh, it's called Sellout. The, the, the distiller which is crazy the distiller's got a chapter in like a big book there what he's one of like the nine bands uh that he profiles in that book okay and uh and the the, the section is, is really interesting they just really didn't have it together um on their own once they got no, as big they as they very, got they were very dependent upon tim yeah and so once that structure wasn't there anymore it felt like you know everyone the band was getting bigger they're still young people like everything kind of hit them all at once so they didn't really last very much longer um after that. I mean, they've done some reunions in stuff uh, I mean, since then look dude people can say whatever they want about tim and brody i don't care it's not a conversation i care to have because i don't i don't i just don't care like it's, it's none of my business man like i don't necessarily think it's that i don't think it's wrong at all i don't think it was that weird i mean circumstantially yeah, it's, it's, so it's just not it, 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 I, it is weird but it's like well one i don't gotta know any of these people really anyway 
and it doesn't yeah. it doesn't really have that much impact on whether their music was good or really, like I don't have to have any moral judgments about well, listening to the music. But, yeah, you know, but, it's not like the other band we were talking about a couple weeks ago at the end of the show. It's right. Like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. my 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 point is is that people give Brody all this credit, and I'm thinking like you know maybe they should pump the brakes a little bit and 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 shine the light back on Tim a little bit because when he's involved with the project, it's successful. Mm-hmm. If you take him out of the interrupters, they wouldn't exist without uh, him. The distillers wouldn't have been as good or as famous or as whatever. Right. So like, I don't know. I, I don't want to like take away from the band. I think that record is amazing, but I do think that once, once this album happened, they got on a major, they went and did things outside of that family yeah. of Hellcat. They fell apart. She made some really weird decisions, and I don't care if they're right or wrong. That's their business. But she made some strange decisions I, I, in her personal life, and then their their music started going a different direction. But it also mimicked the person she started hanging out with. Listen, like just watch what she did with her life. And are you surprised that Coral Fang sounds the way it sounds after she started going on tour with Queens of the Stone Age? She starts hanging out with that guy, dating that guy, gets married to that guy, and then she puts out an alternative record. I mean, are we, is anybody surprised? That actually takes away from her credibility, in my opinion. But I don't care. Like it is what it is. Like I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I've always been a hater of that guy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I don't know that they had some kind of happy home. You know who knows? Well, There's no. Well, right I don't now, really know why. Legally, he's not allowed to be within like certain distance of her. Like that, that all fell apart like about a year ago. Um, Did, I heard. I heard he put his hands on her. Is that true? Yeah, it got it got pretty ugly. I think that's uh, that's but, disgusting, man. That guy needs to be locked up then. Yeah. But uh. And you I know, just think Queens of the Stone Age sucks. How about that? Can we just say that? My brother <laughs> loves that band. I hate that band. <laughs> I do. Too. I hate that band. But like, you know, uh, I think that that was a, a circumstantial hit, and it was just like, without one of those things, it would have worked. It had to have every single piece, and it was a big puzzle, and it formed a picture. And we got Sing Sing Death House, and I think that the record is, it it's like a a time capsule. You can listen to it and go right back to 2002. Mm-hmm. I remember where I was at when it came out. I remember listening to it in a parking lot of a high school in my friend's Honda. I remember uh, I remember watching the very first video that I ever saw her in, and she had the red lipstick on and the white T-shirt, and her hair was all spikes, Liberty yeah. Spikes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And thinking like, uh, I was like, I was like, oh, yeah, that's a woman right there. <laughs> like, yeah, bro. Yes. And so like, and it, but it also encouraged females to be. Uh, fronting bands to start bands, which I think mm-hmm. is amazing. Uh, look at my situation. I've got a little nine-year-old girl that loves punk rock that likes bands like Cat Bite and, and stuff like that, that that wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I don't know. Cat Bite might have formed without the distillers, but um, but they made it more accessible, more of a normal thing for girls to be in punk bands. And I think that's amazing because I want everybody that wants to be in a band to start a band and be successful. Uh, whether or not I like the band is irrelevant i want everybody to do it that can that can do it that wants to do it uh and i think that this album really spearheaded that movement for that era and generation yeah i wish it could have been more what i mean by that is i wish like it wasn't like this wall between the punk rockers and the distillers the years after because i think that could have even been that influence could have been even greater you know what I mean? If it wasn't just because there's some there's like there's some rancid fans that straight up won't listen to any distillers or like they they completely forsake. And I was like, that's kind of unfortunate because it really the influence could have been even greater um, than than it was. I mean, I don't think it's unfortunate. I think if you don't want to listen to it, don't listen to it. No, you but know, I think it's, it, the but, but I think the but, reasons why people don't listen to it doesn't really jive with the scale of like how big the album was, how good it was. I, I, think, like, I think their legacy though is not what it should be because but, of the sides taking. But no, Flat but out. that's but that but that's why it is what it is. That's what their legacy is because of those actions. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it had nothing to do with music. It still had something to do with music. It affected Rancid. It affected their band. It affected a lot of things. So yeah, their legacy is directly attached to that action and those things. And it has to be. You can't take that out of there. You can't go. Yeah, well, just the art, not the artist. You have to take the artist along. But that, but but my point is that's why, like, I was like, oh, that's number one. Like, I don't, I disagree with. Them. I'm looking at this track list, like, oh yeah, I love that album. But yeah, it's because like you don't think of them necessarily. I I think as a first, like, oh, the big the big Hellcat bands from the from the back in the day. I don't like. I don't think I I have to remember. Oh, yeah, the Distillers were on Hellcat. Like they, well, I did not necessarily don't, think of them in that sort of. Dude, you don't range. have to think about that when you hear the Distillers. You don't think of anything other than Hellcat, dude. Come True. on, man. 
But so, when you think of like, Hellcat, you don't necessarily think of the distillers, do you? Why? I do. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't. I don't. That's think crazy to me. In that way. But see, yeah. I'm also not talking about the biggest bands. I'm talking about the most important records on the label. On the label, and no, that would be the most important record on the label mm-hmm. uh, outside of Rancid for that reason, though. But like, you know, we've. I mean, we've already established that we think quite a bit different. So I mean, you know, if you think Hellcat and you don't think Distillers, I don't understand why. Do you also not think of Choking Victim and you know? The more so, I, I, I associate Choking Victim like more so with Hellcat. I'd say that's crazy because they only had one album. So I like, know, but I, so I, like you know, I I, 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 but I just think that the Distillers did things for music that a band with a male lead singer can't do, and for mm-hmm. that reason, I think that it's a little more important. Now, how by how much, dude? We're talking small increments of importance here. Those are the top five. I think the top five stand out on their own as a group versus the rest of the label's life. But I mean, every album I've ever seen on Hellcat, I've been interested in listening to. That right there should tell you a lot. So, yeah. So, is there any band... Okay, here's my last couple of questions, because I know you got to get going. Is there any band that you wish would have signed to Hellcat? Mm, So, like a Hellcat-adjacent band. Yeah, somebody that wasn't on Hellcat that you were like, man, I wish they'd have signed to Hellcat, because they would have done great things if they did. Um... Shoot, I never had never thought about that because I I didn't really separate that from like oh what, maybe if they would have gone to Epitaph or they would have done that so I never thought about that. Sp- sp- I always thought of Hellcat like I never thought of bands coming to Hellcat the way the Unseen did. I always found, thought of Hellcat as like the spawns of Tim. So I never really. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, I was I was, I thought of all the bands even if they didn't, but they that's were all so strange of, to me. So I, the, I the just... other one, I, the other one I was thinking of is one you that you might answer, but the one that's one of your bands. Is your guys in one man army would have totally fit in on Hellcat, wouldn't they? Bro, dude, I wasn't even thinking one man army. Aren't, in yes. your, in, like, if you close your eyes and see them and don't know anything, they like that's you would and told me that's a Hellcat band. I'm like, yeah, that's the pop band on Hellcat. Okay, that's poppy Hellcat. So, band. man, you are dead ass on with that. That's yes, sir. Uh, if you go back to Austin, Texas, there was a band called Born to Lose. I think they had three, maybe four albums. They are literally a top ten band of all time for me. I always wished that they had gotten on Hellcat because they fit the mold so well. So if you haven't ever heard of Born to Lose, not necessarily you specifically, uh, but anybody out there watching this, go check them out, man. Listen to them. They're from Austin, and they're probably my favorite band from Texas of all time, I would think, maybe. Uh, I don't know. That's a pretty bold statement. I have to go back and really think about that. Uh, but George Strait's so going to be pissed. Oh, dude, George Strait's rad, though. But, uh, but I mean, I, you know, just the fact that I would even say that and then have to maybe, maybe rethink it should tell you how much I love that band. But uh, they have a song called Sweet Misery. It's like a top 10 song of all time for me. So, um, yeah, Born to Lose definitely would have been amazing on Hellcat. I think that uh, Liberty and Justice would fit really well on Hellcat if if they were still uh, – I don't know what Hellcat's doing right now, but, like, it would be amazing to see Liberty and Justice on there because their, their last couple of releases have been – I mean, they sound like Hellcat stuff, dude. I, I really wish you would go back and listen to that stuff, Rob. You need to go check out Liberty and Justice Pressure and then anything after that. I think you'd like it way more than you realize. And, uh, you know, it's hard to listen to newer stuff. I, I we're, we're, we're older. We, we we already got what we like. And so I, yeah. I think so. Try to give it a well, chance. It's more it's more of that. It's hard to it's hard for saying. anything to ever measure up. Like like even those newer that's, Hellcat bands, those albums are really good. Uh, they just well, don't have the same residence, right? Yeah, sort of. I, I think if you listen to that uh, Liberty and Justice stuff, you might find that there's a little, uh, what would you call that, like hidden treasure there. Because mm-hmm. I'm telling you, dude, that band sounds so much like a Hellcat band. And if you talk to Ryan, the singer, he'll tell you that's by design. Like, he's our age. He loves the stuff we mm-hmm. love. And, you know, he loves Rancid and all that stuff. So, but yeah, man, this was a blast. That went by way too fast. What are you doing tonight? Another game? Yeah, yeah, bro. This yeah. stuff's kicking my ass, Season dude. Schedule is killing me. I cannot we, wait for this to be over with. We got uh, some stuff coming up though, so we, that's why we're being judicious. So. Yes, yes, yes. Um, let me look real quick at my schedule, and we'll see if we can figure this out real quick before we go. Yeah. Um, excuse me. Pardon me. Sorry for sniffling. I got allergies or something, dude. Rained out here, and it kicked up a bunch of crap in the air. Hold up okay. one second as you're doing that. Okay. There we go. Speaking of okay. moms, I had a, I got a delivery because it's dollar, it's two dollar burger day at Sonic and dude, Texas. nice. She was dude, a burger. Get it, bro. Get it. <laughs> get it, bro. Got to do what you got to do, brother man. Okay, so I work 
uh, Friday and Wednesday, so I have Monday and Tuesday off. Do you want to try to do Monday? Uh, that that's this coming Monday. Yeah, like a like a seven, six days instead of seven. Yeah, and I believe I've got, I've got the day off. I believe so. Oh. We can even do it maybe earlier in the day. I I am I am. Let me type on my schedule, and I want everyone to hear this. This is still in the recorded portion. So Sunday night, newfound glory in the get up kids. Oh, I, I gotta check them out. I am uh, I'm in my zone right there. So they, in that crowd, I'm the hardcore punk in that crowd. I am right? the OG in that group. <laughs> and then oh, that's- I got I got the other show I told you about a couple of days later, a little bigger. Which by the way. Dropkick Murphys and Interrupters are coming very close. I may try to swing them too, but that that wasn't one had to be purchased before the other, and that kind of for sure. Up. But I but I may be hanging with uh, crew members and stuff. more to, more on that later. Okay, okay. Following that, and then I'm hitting the plane to Vegas to see all the pop punk that I could ever want, and headed to the Punk Art Museum. I have all that coming up, and that Bro. starts in six days from now. We've already got we've already got the tickets for the pop, uh, Punk Art Museum tour with the Blue Intruder. Uh, we got three tickets, so we'll we'll square up on that later if we, if we need to. But uh, all all that matters is that we're all three gonna be there. Me, you, and my wife. We're all gonna be hanging out. We're gonna grab some lunch. Uh, so I, I'll probably touch base with you on that Thursday night. So if you have anybody's wondering what we're talking about, dude, we just happen to both be going to Vegas at the same time. We're overlapping by about a day and some change, and so like we get to go hang out in person. I don't know that we ever thought that would actually happen. So uh, yeah, not specifically. Pretty- in vegas like that's a funny yeah yeah course. yeah like we like, could plan it to go and hang out at like one one another's place or something but like randomly both dude i mean come on man so we're gonna go do a walkthrough tour with the punk rock museum i'm also doing a, a visit the like the two days before that without a tour so i can get some just footage like a, and a, around my wife and, and one. We're, yeah yeah we're gonna have a lot of footage from the vegas trip so like as soon as i get back there'll be like a little like a you know drip coffee pot full of content coming mm-hmm. from the vegas trip but uh Heck yeah, man. So let's do next uh, Monday. I'll send you a topic here in a little bit. You don't have to worry about it. I'll come up with something. Yeah. Um, I don't really know off the top of my head. I should have come up with something. And I just didn't. I've had a lot of stuff going on with my stomach. That hernia thing really sucks. So I've been kind of distracted. But um, awesome, dude. Well, go have fun, man, with your with your kiddo, dude. I hope they do well. Uh, and I'll talk to you here soon. I'll text you in an hour or so with a, with a topic. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We love you guys. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel. Go check out the Punk Ots, all that stuff. Dude, we're almost at 1,000, bro. Can you believe that? Come on, guys. Get Dude, it I'm like 50, I'm like 50 away, bro. Like, let's go. Anyways, Takes most man, of us years. My homeboy does it in like a few months, so let's get, Gross. It, get bro. it going. <laughs> it's so crazy, <laughs> dude. I love you guys, man. Y'all take it easy. Peace. Peace.